we go. All right, it looks like we're live for the first now live broadcast of We the Individuals Live, where we believe in the novel proposal that we each choose our own manner of being governed. For those of you that watch some of our pre-recorded shows, you already know Jeff Peterson II, the uh, founder and owner of We the Individuals. And with us again, we also have Andy Catherman. And joining us today for the first time would be Blaine Kelly, who is uh, an economics major at Bradley University. And, of course, to join us in our anarchism versus minarchism debate, which is the topic of tonight's show, we do have a real-life minarchist, which I feel are even rarer than anarchists anymore, just because you guys don't last very long before converting to anarchy, is my experience. But with us is Joseph. I didn't get your last name, and I didn't get much background information with you, so is it all right if I ask you to introduce yourself? Uh, yes, yes. Joseph Johnson is my whole name. I am a student at Sacramento State University, and my major is government and soon-to-be econ. <laughs> government and soon-to-be econ. All right. So as we said, Joseph is a minarchist. And what we're doing today, it's a little bit different. Normally I have a full list of questions, and I, I try to ask everybody um, you know, their thoughts on whatever the topic is, Bernie Sanders or left libertarianism libertarianism, but since we actually have somebody that disagrees with us, I want a little bit of a back and forth. So I'm hoping, Joseph, that you can provide some questions with us about anarchy and your objections to anarchy while we provide, of course, our questions and our objections to minarchism. Um, so starting off with that, I, w I would kind of like to see from the anarchists, Jeff, Blaine, and uh, Andy, uh, what is it that drives you to anarchism? Did you spend any time as a minarchist? I did. I spent about 12 seconds as <laughs> a as a minarchist before converting to anarchy. Um, what about you guys? Jeff, we'll start with you. Sorry. Okay, well, uh, I've been, uh, <clears throat> prior to being an anarchist, I was a um, minarchist all of my life. I've never been anything else besides a libertarian. And, and I think it was... Um, Probably around the time of uh, 2012, when Ron Paul got suckered out of the uh, primaries, that was um, that's right when I actually read the or heard an audio clip of uh, Rothbard's For New Liberty, where he starts talking about if the state had a monopoly on shoes for time immemorial. Imagine if you're a libertarian and you came along and and introduced the idea of privatizing shoes. And then he said this old status arguments of what about the poor people? What about the prices of shoes? What will be the last? So, and he said as, as silly as these ideas are to re regarding shoes, they're almost as stupid as when you put them to any step to run by government. So um, then I, uh, uh, that's, that's pretty much actually around that time what really made me an anarchist. And then uh, also the idea that whenever you have taxes, you're going to have a seri series of endless excuses to expand the state. Um, even if you have minimum taxes. So I was a libertarian for years, but then um, became an anarchist in 2012. Sure. So Ron Paul opened the floodgates. I'm sure that's the answer for a lot of people, but that's a good one. I mean, that's a lot of us just had the light bulb go off through some simple argument like that. Blaine, I don't know you very well. This is the first we've ever met. What drove you to the, the crazy idea of anarchy? Uh, for me, it was um, a process of finding economics and uh, studying Austrian economics, and then slowly over time, I just turned towards uh, anarchism after reading Murray Rothbard. Uh, so I think I read For New Liberty uh, by Murray Rothbard, and uh, my hang-up, of course, was uh, those areas which the state has always uh, tended to occupy, which, of course, are police and courts. Um, and military defense. And so after reading those chapters uh, in Rothbard's book, that was really the starting point um, for when I became an anarchist. And then uh, from there, it's just been reading um, uh, a lot of stuff from people like Walter Block, Hans Hermann Hoppe, um, and uh, Robert Murphy. And so just over time, yeah, I, I became uh, an anarchist in the span of maybe uh, a week or two. All right. Andy, final word from you. Uh, what drove you to the, this cult? Uh, yeah, so I I probably would say I spent quite a bit, I'd say maybe like a year or two. Um, I was really kind of had my awakening. It was more economics driven, um, like uh, I think Blaine said. And uh, I was really into Austrian economics. I was really 
was such a, a good explanation. I was looking for an explanation of the after the financial crash, um, and all of the talking heads on TV or just weren't giving me anything that I could really understand or believe. And so, in, in thinking about all of the things through Austrian economics and explaining how the free market um, works and and how it has an answer for pretty much um, every um, everything, it. I, I delve mo more into like the ethics side of it, and uh, um, obviously Ron Paul was part of that. But I, as uh, Blaine said, I read uh, For New Liberty and and uh, the Ethics of Liberty, and then I've read um, a lot from Herman Hop Hans Hermann Hoppe on like the democracy that the God the God that failed. That was really kind of the the nail in the coffin for me, um, in sense that uh, showing. Um, there's things in this world, economic goods that that are goods, and talking about government which produces bads. And that I think that was the most compelling thing that really uh, popped the light bulb for me. But um, I was pretty much bef before that I was more of a, I guess your typical Republican um, type of you know middle of the road type of of guy. So that's so kind you of went my, full my, swing. You went. Re Republican all the way into anarchy. You didn't have any time spent in the whole minarchist. I think no. I think I was like for about a year. I was trying to, like, I read Rothbard. And I was like, well, you know, still it doesn't. Like he's got he's got me, but there's this you know the part was the defense part you know because that's the right. classic argument. That was that was the toughest argument the, for me as well. The 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 military and the courts and you know, oh you're an anarchist so you don't believe in law like oh you're you're just for chaos and I think. Those straw man kind of um, were in the back of my head, but uh, yeah, I, I did. I'd say for about a, a year, I was like grasping at straws to kind of justify my minarchism. So I probably have quite a bit of in common with uh, uh, with Joseph, um, at least. Well, where, I'm sure we all right there's, now. there's not a very wide chasm between minarchy and anarchy. So yeah. Joseph. Um, obviously, we came to you last because you're the only person that is not an anarchist. So what is what's the holdup, man? The holdup is that I, I was I was Democrat. You know, Obama was my big political socialization event. He brought me into the politics. You no know, black guy running for president and won. And you know, growing up, you know, being being grown up black in poor neighborhoods, I'm kind of you're black. I know, right? <laughs> People rarely see that. <laughs> and being around just poverty all the time, everywhere I went, there's homelessness, there's starving kids and women and men. And really, it's like the, the compassion aspect is that I, I understand that government has little to no benefits for you know my community, for poverty and all that. But the idea of Ending programs like food stamps and Section 8, these you know, programs that I've, that my family and families that I know have benefited from significantly. That idea of ending those and going pure anarchist versus being a mini anarchist and still still trying a anarchist and still trying to accommodate my my views on welfare and support and compassion and all that with going full anarchy and how to uh, how, how to accommodate that with that final push, and I've sure. yet to see how that's possible. Sure. Okay, I understand, and and I think that's fair. Even uh, Frederick Bastiat um, argued in favor of minor state-sponsored forms of welfare, as as minimalist as he was. So that's a that's a really a relatively Bastiat-esque position. So I think we can all accept that. Um, so what is the full scope, if I can ask, uh, in terms of the role of government that you believe? And when I ask this, I, I kind of also want to know, like, how, how do we um, gain taxes in your minarchist ideal? What does the government do, and how does it fund it? So, you know, for me, it's like, you guys are mentioning the idea of the, uh, you know, military, military courts and... Police. Right, the big three are military but, courts and the police. Is there anything yeah. else that, that the government should do? Although my view of police are not, it's not one of the big one of the <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you No, know, the whole the whole black thing comes into play. <laughs> I've not had many good experiences with them, but the idea of the uh, being able to 
I don't put it. Being able to seek damages to from people who harm me or aggression stuff. You know, I'm robbed, I'm stabbed, whatever. Being able to seek uh, compensation, compensation or you know, some other kind of benefit from not being stabbed from this person who stabbed me. And the idea of uh, defense and, like you said, the uh, minimal welfare, basically, to help support. So it would be how, my, how, how I view government, how the roles I view it in, mm-hmm. and pay for it through bills, taxes, and voluntary taxes for you know, minimal programs like minimal programs like welfare and mm-hmm. the courts through fees and such. No, no income tax. No so income, no income, income tax is with this, uh, you, like, maybe a sales tax? Sales tax. Okay, sales that tax was my last fees. vestige of taxation that I supported. I was a sales tax guy before I was an income tax guy, so I can't yell at you too much either for that. Um, okay, so... Well, let's start with uh, the welfare question. Then I'm gonna bring I'm gonna bring the anarchist, and I, I do apologize because we outnumber you here, but um, <laughs> we've got to bring him in. Jo- Jeff's raising his hand, so I'll start with him. How do we how do we do welfare privately? Well, you know, as as it stand as it stands now, there's you know for the you know uh, this this being even well coming from a liberal standpoint, you know, there's and you mentioned Bostia before. There's the whole argument that he said that. You know, the socialists will say just because we want the government out of it means that we don't want the service at all. But that's, you know, obviously that's false. But uh, to answer this question, you know, as, as it stands now, there are poor who rely on it because they lack productive cap, you know, capacity, the old and infirm and so on. And then there's those who rely on it because its existence creates an incentive to rely on it. Now, if you narrow it down to who actually can't care for themselves, um... And the financial burden becomes considerably considerably smaller, much more easily handled by private uh, private givers, who, by the way, they're not being you know taxed half to death and told that their good deeds are therefore done. Um, social welfare programs significantly crowd out private charity, and then even so, private charity from in the U.S. anyway, uh, from what I heard, is in the hundreds of billions per year, and that's just what's tracked, not counting help from friends and family, which almost certainly exceeds even that. Um, I think I read somewhere that in 2006 it was about $300 billion, enough to give uh, $10,000 a year to 10% of the population. So if you abolish taxes and um, caring for the poor is basically not even a problem that has to be thought about. And also, I think once if you were to abolish not only taxes but the state, the state creates several countless barriers to entry Occupational licenses, minimum wage laws, get rid of those barriers to entry, and you're going to have much more entrepreneurs, much more people that are going to be hired as employees. Um, so I think it'll be something that will uh, will be uh, corrected on its own. All right, and I don't want to uh, make this too imbalanced in the let's hear the anarchy versus the minarchy arguments, but uh, I do want to ask if Blaine or Andy, do either of you guys have anything to add, or did Jeff cover it? Because I think that was a pretty good answer. Um, yeah, I just I just want to make one one small thing is sure. that um, when you know when the government makes this argument like they are there to care for the poor and only they can care for the poor, and yet. Um, it's kind of this classic example of, you know, if I went to each one of your guys' um, house and knocked on the door and said, and said give me your money um, or else I'm going to shoot you. And But the reason I'm giving, I'm holding you up is because I'm going to go give it to some people that need it. Mm-hmm. Um, we, so we would think that would be kind of sketchy to say the least. Um, but yet when we hire or vote for politicians to pretty much do that exact same thing um, – I don't really see the difference so much, uh, principally wise. And what, one second, one second point is that when uh, we rely on the government to provide welfare, we're crowding out those other institutions that it is their charter goal to actually do that, and they do it so much better with minimal resources um, than the government could ever hope to do. So that's that's one thing that I actually had the same concern, but. Um, and looking at it from an economic standpoint and a moral standpoint, I've come around to a different perspective. 
Sure. Yeah, and crowding, crowding out is always one of my favorite arguments. It's such a great libertarian argument, minarchist or anarchist, because that's when the government just takes so heavily over an industry for anybody that doesn't, uh, isn't familiar with these economic terms, that there's no market for a private entity to take in there. So it doesn't prove by any means that because a private entity doesn't exist in an industry that it couldn't. Um, but let's, let's move on from there. Oh, real um, quick, I just add, uh... Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so just on top of what uh, Jeff and Andy said, um, I also want to bring in public choice economics, which uh, okay. basically when we look at um, uh, any sort of state-run program, we're inevitably going to have uh, first the calculation problem, which, as Mises pointed out, um, basically says that there's no rational way for the state to allocate any sort of uh, resources in a rational sense. Um, so there's going to be necessarily waste uh, involved with that uh, with that execution, uh, but also uh, from a public choice standpoint. Standpoint, um, I was reading numbers where uh, if you took all of the money that was confiscated through taxation um, that is intended for welfare, uh, and you actually gave that to the poor, they would be in the one percent right now. Uh, so instead, we actually have. Uh, the majority of that um, money going to support the bureaucracy, which is established to regulate and control and execute this uh, welfare, whereas when you contrast that with, say, the private organizations of uh, churches and private charities and things like that, then uh, they're still bureaucratic, bureaucratically run in the economic sense, um, but they're not bureaucratic in the political sense. Uh, that is to say that... Um, they're going to uh, utilize the resources efficiently, and if they don't, then they're going to go out of business or lose donors and things like that, and they're actually accountable to market forces, um, whereas the state uh, has every incentive to uh, pilfer those, those funds and to uh, manipulate them and use them for political ends um, before their actual intended ends being welfare. Sure. Okay. So I feel like from Jeff and Blaine, we got good pragmatic arguments, and Andy brought up the philosophical and moral point as well. And I want to get to pragmatism and philosophical differences later, but I kind of want to save that closer to the end of the show. Joseph, I want you to elaborate on something else you said, which was uh, one of the big three under um, under minarchy, which is the court system. Uh, you mentioned uh, restitution. If you get robbed, anything of this nature. Uh, so I, I guess what I want elaboration on before we move back to, to the anarchists is do you see our current court system as, as positive? A lot of people do believe it is the best justice system in the world. Um, or if not, how would you like to see this executed if it's not going to occur under, under anarchy? Yeah, yeah our, our court system is... Uh... Shitty? Uh, we, okay, we'll go with that. <laughs> yeah. The current yeah. system is, uh, you know, not representative of anybody but wealthy white men. And pretty much how I, how, how, I, how I would see the court system, uh, my ideal minarchist government, is it would be more responsive, where people will have more of a I say in the court system itself, where it wouldn't be as imposed as it is now. Sure. And basically, who chooses the judges, who becomes jurors, all that would be more responsive to us versus all that being appointed and designed by people we have no control over. Now, many judges are elected and many trials um, are jury trials. Um, is this similar to the model you're proposing? Well, many judges are chosen once every decade or so, which after that that first after that election, they're pretty much free to do as they will. And oh, okay, I see. yeah, lifetime appointments, things like that. Yeah. This is what. Okay, okay, I see. All right, um, Andy, let's start with you this time. How do you respond? Well, um, you know, that's it's a it's an interesting. Uh, it's interesting how Joseph put that because um, I, th I think in, in, in all of our ideal situation, 
we would be able to um, uh, have, and we would have a market for justice. And I think that was the biggest thing for me. I didn't quite understand um, how this would look, and we would have a market for um, jurors. We would have a market for having like you know how you like rate your professors and stuff. Like there's different apps out there. There would there would be um, um, judges out there that would be a part of these you know what do we call them DROs or uh, dispute resolution comp companies. So Chris and I we have a, we have a dispute. You know maybe he came over and clubbed me on the head. Um, he thinks I deserved it. I don't. Um, so we're going to go and try to find mutual arbitration. So therefore we both in order to settle our dispute uh, we would go and try to find a uh, a, a, a judge that we would both agree to, or our insurance companies would both agree to, if we're from different insurance companies or different res dispute your resolution companies, and so I don't really know how what would be a better outcome to get those judges that we think are good and other people have kind of vouched for that and they've had credibility. So uh, I, I think I agree with Joseph. I think we just maybe just disagree on uh, how to go about doing that. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's worth mentioning for, for anybody that may not know is this isn't just theory. Um, I do know that, that there are organizations in dispute is an actual organization, the American Adjudication Association. These are private dispute adjudication companies. Mostly uh, they're, they're used for global trade. Um, they're underwritten in contracts for international companies. So it, it does, there, is, there is already some semblance of... And then if you, uh, if you actually... If you actually, and I didn't mean to cut you off, but if you actually look at Zero Law, if you look at Zero Somali Law, um, like what Friedman has written on, um, also... Uh, if you love Somalia so much, Jeff, you can just... Cut it off. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, if you look at Zero Law and also like uh, Law, I think it was in, I want to say either Iceland or Ireland, but they also had private they, law. that they both, was they both did, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know David Friedman writes a lot about Icelandic law. Um, they had uh, systems of adjudication where you essentially had like uh, a, I think a chieftain of sorts that was a, a landed like respected elder of some sort that would adjudicate the disputes for his little decentralized community. Um, Ireland had something similar. Murray Rothbart writes about Ireland. There are a lot of systems of private private adjudication that have happened in the past. And this kind of brings into something else. And Blaine, I'm going to come to you on this one because I, I don't mean to skip you on the court one, but you know, with there are five of us. Um, prisons. So, Joseph, you mentioned uh, restitution, and that's one of the things that I bring up when I'm arguing anarchy is, under our current system, if I get robbed, I don't get restitution. I get paid back by a private insurance company that I have to pay premiums to. The state is the only person that actually benefits um, from this because the crime against me is not treated as a crime against me in our court system. It's treated against a crime against the government and this person sits in prison, doesn't pay me back anything, and I pay taxes to house him in jail. Do you think under your systems there would be prisons or there would be other solutions? Well, there's certainly a lot of the things that uh, people get sent to prisons for. Prison wouldn't be a, uh, there wouldn't be laws to, that would create as many prisoners as there is now. There would be no need or incentive to have prisoners. Well, I mean, okay, so let's now. get rid of nonviolent criminals, let's get rid of drug offenders, but we got robbers, rapists, and murderers. What do we do with these people? We should have communities build prisons that put the people in. Okay, would they be private or government? <laughs> yeah, that's... This is a tough question for yeah. anarchists. I'm not trying to pick on you, of yeah, course. I know. I get it. It's, like, it's, it's a very specific question that hasn't sure. really been addressed specifically before. So it's sure. Been but uh, it would be it would be government run. It'd be okay. More, so it'd be so more local, but it would be smaller prisons. But that that could still be a function of government, just like the okay. I, I, and that's yeah. that's fair. Um, Blaine, I skipped you last time, so I want to come to you. Um, how does anarchy handle prisons? Um, well, there's several different uh, theories on that, I think. Um, notably, the most different uh, would be Robert Murphy, I think, and Murphy's written on uh, this. Of course, he's a uh, pacifist, so I think he has a few different views than uh, most minarchists. Um, but essentially what Murphy's saying, um, and I like this because uh, the reason I find Murphy's argument so compelling is that it would work in a 
pacifist society. So let, let's say, for instance, um, there's a lot of uh, uh, people who will uh, dismiss anarchism as being sort of pacifist or something like that, as uh, we're all subject to the ravages and um, uh, the barbarism of uh, criminals and such. So even if we grant that assumption, um, Murphy's argument basically is that with uh, these sorts of criminals, if you're going to have uh, that sort of behavior, um, you're not going to be uh, able, uh, liable for transactions or anything like that. Um, you're going to be uh, basically a social pariah. And so how is it that um, you know, murderers and rapists and thieves and people like that are going to get anywhere without the sort of division of labor, labor and uh, uh, just prosperity in general that is created by the free market? The answer is, of course, that they're not. You know, um, so basically what's left of these people is uh, either they can go live out in the woods or something or um, they're forced to go to any this sort of uh, institution that would be provided to say, okay, um, we know that you're this sort of person who is um, uh, who tends to do these sorts of commit these sorts of crimes against person and property. Uh, so we're going to let you live here, um, and then uh, you'll just be you know isolated from the rest of the society and uh, so on and so forth. Um, but again, that that's just the uh, pacifist view. The uh, the ostracism. Yeah, basically okay. social social ostracism and um, basically cutting off trade. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, if you're a murderer, right? Um, you still need water. You still need food. You still need basic, you know, necessities, clothing, housing, insurance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and basically, if you're a known murderer, uh, then no one's going to, you know, trade with you or do anything like that. Are you referring to uh, chaos theory? Is this what he writes about in chaos theory? I believe it's in chaos theory. Yeah. yeah I, I read that a very long time ago, so I just I, I wasn't 100% on that. Okay. Um, Jeff, do you have anything to add? Or? Um, yeah, well, only, I mean, he blamed mostly cover but was, I actually was going to ask Joseph a question, but before I did that, I was going to say, I was just going to kind of reiterate, like, what uh, Blaine was saying, um, is that, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, there's the private institution that you'd live and work, work your room and board that Robert Murphy talks about in Chaos Theory, and there's also the uh, notion of, um, um, you know, if it's a, uh, it's either social outcast, um, outlaw in the sense of the ancient sense of the word, because outlaw is uh, you're uh, outside the law. You uh, didn't have any protection from the law, institutionalized protection. And, and uh, yeah, you'd either be a social outcast, or if the punishment was so severe, um, then people might be able to have their own vigilante justice on you. So, uh, But um, anyway, my, my question was going to be to Joseph, is that with this ideal... Uh, minarchist law. Let's say if I was wanting to uh, live in a live in this minarchist state or society, so to speak. If I uh, wanted to live in a society and I'm paying taxes towards this uh, um, towards this uh, court system, would I be able to opt out of this court system and be able to set up my own competition to compete with yours? Um, and then if it doesn't work, opt back into this system without any threat of going to jail for not paying taxes into this system. That's what my, I was going to ask, ask Joseph. I think it's um, a fair question. Are you thinking about it or did we lose you? No, I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about oh, okay, it. just making sure. Sorry. Yeah, I'm thinking about how... Trying to form the words properly, or my response properly. Oops. Yeah, it seemed that that would uh that could depend because the you know, arg is my version of the mini arg is not a the federal government itself it may not be that strong and that there are there would still be you know, the 50 states that we have now like the same including the United States, it's still 50 states with their own governments, and the federal government itself would not be that strong. And there could be some states that allow other forms of court system, other forms of, of justice, such as a private company 
dealing out the uh, dealing out the justice, and they had everybody has to abide by it. Like if you like it'd be that way in Vermont versus here in California, there's only one, and it's not a, we're not a, there's no other form of there's no other way to seek justice from any private corporation because it wouldn't wouldn't be a federal court system. It would it would just be state based because the different problems across different states having one court system does not does not solve anything. For one set of laws, a problem in California is not the same problem in Vermont. So having the same universal law such as that across 50 states wouldn't make sense. So it would depend based on what people want in their states. Well, but what I meant is if, if I lived in a society of yours, if I said I'm not paying taxes for this court system, would, like today's society, if, if I wasn't to do that, would you put me in jail for not paying taxes to that? Could I opt out and opt back in voluntarily and create competition with your monopoly, or sorry, with your, with your minarchist court society, or system, sorry? Yeah, again, that would, that could vary. First, I wouldn't, in the form of sales taxes, where how you pay it is, is optional, how if you're a business owner and you don't want to do it, you can use your license or another other, other various ways, but being thrown in jail could depend on the state, where you can just be, you can be fined repeatedly, or... Well, let me let me actually rephrase it this way. If I, you know, you know the service. If you don't, you know, if you don't use it, you uh, if you don't pay taxes, you don't have to. You're not able to take advantage of it. So, that, are you saying like if I was to opt out of these services, I wouldn't be able to take advantage of the court system? Let's say I'm not paying for taxes, and all of a sudden someone robs my house, I wouldn't be able to take advantage of your court system because I'm not um, paying into it. Is that would that be fair? Yeah. Okay. Well, the, my, my only real response to that is is that, you know, if, it, if it's a state, then, you know, by any sane definition of the word, it's not voluntary. Because if you can withhold your tax dollars and forego the state's legal services, as a con consequence, it's not a state. I, I don't think it's any different from any service you voluntarily agree to on the market. Um, you know, you cannot, I think with with the state is that you cannot have a monopoly on law without forcing competitors to stop competing. Thus, the state must, at a minimum, coerce people to use the state as the monopoly provider because otherwise the state is like any other business competing for consumers with no obligation to use the, sir, the, to use the states. Um, and then, uh, you, know, you know, taxation, I think, is always coercion. and monopoly is always the banning of competition. Um, the nature of imposing a monopoly and then not allowing free riders mandates this. Otherwise, I refuse, refuse to pay, and I refuse to allow you to override my natural rights for free association. Um, because, yeah, in order for the state to actually have services, it'll, it'll have to have that monopoly. And if you, um, if, if it's, if it's voluntarily, then by, it cannot be a state if it's voluntary. So at that point is when you start going into, kind of going into anarchism. You're a, so, if it's voluntary, I can pay it for whenever I want. You're kind of becoming, speaking like an anarchist at this point. Let me jump in, because that's actually one of the things I wrote in, um, which was how do we define these labels? Because I, I think that's always a valid question, and I'm always suspicious when somebody calls themselves a minarchist as to how they're going to tax um, which is why that was one of my first questions, because if we don't make taxation mandatory, then I, I do consider it anarchism. But um, I've talked to people that, that refuse to call themselves anarchists that say, well, I believe in voluntary taxation, and I believe that it could fund these purposes, but that's minarchy. Are, are we just splitting hairs here? I mean, is, that, is it semantics? Well, well how, how I view the state is a de facto institution that exists and is already, are already widely understood and known and used. People actively have people already actively participate in it. 
that represents a massive group of people versus how I would view a private corporation where that is, you know, supported by those who want it, as products, you know, how basically how different business in the state is, how it's the fact of how that's what people already, already use and go to, and that there's a relationship already made with through taxation and services provided from that. So that's that's kind of how I uh, view the difference between the state and a private corporation. That 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 if that, if that helps. So can I, can I just ask? Oh yeah, go ahead, Blaine. Yeah, real quick. Um, are, are you saying you don't view the state as de jure? You're viewing it as de facto. Yeah. Okay, so then, what what would be de jure in your uh, in your view? Uh, because if the state is not de jure, then I don't know what is. De deserved. De jure. Uh, Define the term, Blaine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, de jure, basically meaning uh, fiat or by law, um, as opposed to de facto, which is sort of spontaneous arising out of spontaneous order. So, As in, if it doesn't have the ability to force people to abide by what we might term or call the social contract, I, I guess is that what you're asking, Blaine? Yeah. So essentially, if you're if you're viewing the market's um, interactions with the state as de facto as opposed to de jure, then uh, you're really uh, just expanding the goalposts on de jure, uh, on de facto so much that you can't define de jure is, is what I'm saying. So basically you've now included the state in um, in your definition of the spontaneous order of the market. You're, you're mixing the two. And what I'm saying is that uh, they, they can't be mixed. They're uh, completely different. I want to see I want to see if I can clarify this like bridge this gap um, for both for both of you and you tell me if I'm wrong. The the way I always give an example for people is like church, church tithing and church governance. If people join a church it's voluntary, but they abide by rules. They abide by church rules. There are certain churches that say if you don't follow these behaviors we're not going to give you membership and some membership even comes with benefits that and that would be things like welfare. I know in the Mormon church they'll actually help you when you lose your job and things of that nature. But it's completely voluntary. The tithing isn't involuntarily given because I'm not forced to go to the church even if I'm forced to tithe. And we would acknowledge that there's a form of governance, but I wouldn't call that a government. And that's where I draw the line. Joseph, is if we look at the church model, not necessarily from a religious, but just a practical standpoint, is that kind of how you're defining the state? Well, this is similar. I don't... I mean, the state is uh, it's a... It's a social construct that it's... That's, let's say we were to get rid of government today, no, get rid of the. I like it. I like the it. Whole institution. Sign you me would, up. <laughs> you would automatically, through various reasons, seek to reform a government. What reasons? We're all black, so let's form an all-black government. Or we all live in this city that already had existed before. We all live in this area. Let's form a organization or de facto government mm -hmm. to represent ourselves, defend ourselves, the rest of, you know, laws, situation like that. All those varieties, people mm -hmm. would automatically form them. There's that so maybe is this, humans are naturally drawn together and autumn always will seek to find stability through norms and rules created, mm -hmm. and that always leads to a government. The one one thing I wanted to say there is because he kind of touch bases on something that first of all, I mean, I think um, one he's kind of and Blaine might agree with me that he's as Rothbard would say he's conflating this state with society, and second is. Um, is that I think one of the biggest objections to anarchism is that a state will rise or another state will come and uh, another state will come and take us over. But if you're upset about you know if you're upset about if, if you're upset about 
governments rising and coming and taking over, it sounds like you have some underlying objections to the state and that anarchists. Um, and another thing that actually uh, Rothbard actually said, I actually had this stuff because I knew it was going to come up, is that he quoted in a chapter of uh, in a For New Liberty, it's one of my favorite quotes of him, it says, uh, but suppose, just suppose that despite all these handicaps and obstacles, despite the love for their newfound freedom, despite the inherent checks and balances of the free market, suppose anyway that the state manages to re establish itself. What then? Well, then all that would happen is that we would have a state once again. We will be no worse off than we are now with our current state. And as one libertarian philosopher has put it, at least the world will have a glorious holiday. Um, Karl Marx's ring and promise applies far more to a libertarian society than to communism. In trying freedom to abolish the state, we have nothing to lose and everything to gain in trying in, in doing so. Yeah, and uh, I, I, we need to start wrapping this up, so I want to round this off. But I think Jeff makes a point that I was waiting for somebody to make. <laughs> I, I think that might be the argument between whether or not we will have government I, I hold no delusions that we're going to be abolishing government anytime soon, and if we did, I think you might be right, Joseph. People might form coercive governments. I hope not, but they might be. But that's different than should we have government, and that could be a different, which means you might already be thinking a little bit anarchical, but maybe I'm just projecting on you. Andy, I want to hear uh, your last thoughts on this before I ask my final question. You haven't jumped in for a while. Yeah, so um, this is what Joseph had said about, like, in his... Well, so the state is abolished, and then this is going to be a black uh, group of citizens are going to form their own government. Um, but like the question is, well, what if let's say a couple of those people within that new government they want to like that are living in a jurisdiction they want to opt out or they want to secede? What if that new government are they going to allow that person or those groups of people to secede or? You know, oh, well, we like these other people across the river better, um, so we're gonna we're gonna take we're gonna uh, align ourselves with their forms of justice, their forms of um, just social interaction and social norms. Like that, that's the question. Is um, I, I think, and I, and I again, the the I don't even like the term like confl conflating the words the state and government. Government government isn't necessarily bad. Like there's there's a totally um, voluntary forms of governance. You know, you brought up, Chris, you brought up the, the church model. Like, I'm a Catholic, okay, and um, I, you know, by, I, I follow um, as best as I can. I'm a, I'm, I fail at it, but I, I follow the church teachings, and um, my wife and I, we try to uh, go to church every week, and we try to raise our kids in a certain uh, manner consistent with that. That's a form of governance, um, but it's, if I say, you know what, I think I'm going to ignore that whole rule about like uh, you know whatever it is. I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to tithe like I should. They don't they don't kick me out. They don't like you know throw me in chains and throw me in jail. Um, so they might you know say hey why aren't you contributing to our uh, parish a little bit more? You know you're of good means. We we can need your use your help. That that's it's a simple ask. But they're not going to like throw me in jail. Yeah, they so, make you do a bunch of hell marys though. Exactly. I'm going to you know. Same thing. I'm gonna go to confession and and say our um, our, our Father and Hail Marys for those people that are Catholic know what the heck I'm talking about. For those of you who don't, I apologize. Uh, I I think just to go back real quick, um, I think um, Joseph's just not very far away from what we're talking about. Um, and I th I think if uh, with some more, uh, I I can see myself in like a similar place where you were. Joseph, so I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful you'll come around to our, uh, our, our train of thinking, our tra train of thought. I think every, I think every anarchist pretty much has spent some time in the anarchist bullpen. I, I think, I think someone as close to, as close to Joseph, has a lot of, uh, a lot of the, the disagreements that, um, that uh, we have with him just seem to be a matter of semantics because a lot of it actually comes down to definitions of what is actually the state. What is actually government? What is government? Um, so actually, maybe reading more into that, and then he'll kind of see a distinction between the two. So, you know, that's a lot of time when I discuss it with minarchists. It just comes down to a uh, debate on what terms actually mean, and um, that seems to be where Joseph is actually right now. Well, uh, I I'd like to start wrapping this up. I have one final question, um, and so Joseph, 
we obviously um, agree on more than we disagree, just like Jeff was just saying. Uh, so I guess as a final question, I want everybody's input on this. Um, can we, can anarchists and minarchists work together, activism, project, I mean, what, what should we be doing to the point that we at least get to minarchy where in practical terms we can disagree? Because right now we're fighting for the same things. We're so far from minarchy and anarchy that we're all, I mean, th there's no reason to make a practical distinction with us. So can we and should we be working together? I think at the end of the day, odds are we will always be on the same side because, like you said, we're, we are very far far from where today is, where the state and government, all that is today, to where our ideal is, is that we will always be fighting the same policies, same politicians, the same thing. So for, all, for practical reasons, we are practically the same in the view of almost everybody else. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm curious. Do you do you vote still? Yes, not consistently because there's a lot of bullshit. But, you know. I, and you don't have to answer this <laughs> only onto this is truly my own uh, my own curiosity. How do, how do you as a minarchist vote? I still when I when I was there by the way I just so I can embarrass myself I voted for whoever I voted for overseer Goody. I did the Walter Block thing um, and I voted for overseer Goody. So if um, if you don't want to answer that, that's okay, but I'll put myself out there first. How do you vote under this mindset? Well, if I don't like anybody, any politician running, I don't vote for it. I don't, I don't vote at all for any politician, so just to avoid that whole you know, moral issue, I just, I just don't support him. No, no voting for the lesser <laughs> of two evils, right? Yeah. And, okay. And because I live in California, it's pretty much pointless. Yeah, it's pointless, <laughs> pointless anyway. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but on the you know more local issues, statewide issues, you no, know, for local politicians, yeah, you know, same, same, same rule, not lesser two evils. But uh, when it comes to you know like referendums, since we have that here, if I like the idea, then I may vote for it. If I don't like it, then no. And if I don't understand it, then I'm just not going to vote. So sure, which which puts you really, really close to us. Um, okay, uh, let's hear from the rest of you guys. Jeff, can we can we work with this statist? Uh, this this is a uh, kind of funny because a couple weeks ago you asked me if we can live if I can work with a left libertarian and I said no. Um, Easier though now, right? Yeah. But with uh, with a minarchist, I think yes because it's with someone like Joseph, you know, like I said, he's so close to it. It's just like the terms that need to be distinguished. But I think. Even if we try to get on the way to a stateless society, I'll do my best to convince them. So while we're on the way to a minarchist society, you know, I'll convince them to go stateless. And then um, there's just the one hurdle of, you know, if, if people are bad, you know, the circular argument. If people are, people are bad, there, uh, pe if, uh, people are bad, therefore we need a uh, government made up of the people. So it's just a circular argument. Um, I think that's the one thing that they actually get stuck on. Um, but I, I think that's just a matter of time. It's just by convincing them. They 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 think that they uh, don't necessarily want to be ruled. It's that they're just scared shitless of other people being not being ruled, and being ruled themselves is a consequence of that that insecurity. So it's just getting past that insecurity that I think that I'm willing to work with them. Um, in, I, in I'm, this sure, I'm sure there's some pragmatic objections in there as well. I want to be. As fair yeah, as obviously, right, right. Um, final word, Blaine. What, what do you think? Um, yeah, uh, I, I could uh, see us working with them, um, so to speak. Uh, but I will uh, always be uncompromising. I do see a need for uh, the purists among us. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm all for uh, education and uh, spreading the ideas and the philosophy. Um, but yeah, just so long as uh, uh, they abide by a uh, libertarian axiom and such, um, then I don't see much of an issue with it. Sure. There's nothing uh, inherently antithetical. Sure. Andy, final thoughts? Oh uh, yeah, um, I, I agree with what Blaine said. I I uh, I think like if we're you know, we're always gonna we're gonna um, if if we had our choice, could we have like you know. Uh, Two percent income tax versus what we have now. Like, mm. yeah, sure, go all all for it. Lower my 
my damn taxes. I don't, I'm not going to complain. But uh, I agree with Blaine as far as like um, being a quote purist, you know, if you want to call it that, or being dogmatic. I think Chris you used that. Uh, I didn't use that mass. word once tonight. Not, not tonight. <laughs> I agree with you. Um, or Glaber. <laughs> or Josiah I, I, Warren. I didn't mention him. Oh. <laughs> Uh, ruined. <laughs> no, but I, I just think it's uh, the, the thing about with minarchy is like it just isn't. It's if you believe that the market is uh, has the ability to provide uh, the best outcomes for um, when it comes to people selling goods in the marketplace, I think it could also sell or provide for goods and the um, and those those things that minarchists um, hold up as maybe the the one objection. But I, so I think uh, it's it's good that we um, it, it's a logically consistent thing uh, anarcho-capitalism as uh, or uh, you know being a Rothbardian as I kind of like to call myself um, because it's a logically consistent framework and that just as a programmer I, I love that because you know everything has to uh, compile and I think uh, that compiles for me. Sure, yeah, and and I think all that's fair. I'll say that. As far as working together with Minarchists myself, I'm willing to do it as long as it's not too much trouble. Um, my political activism pretty much ends with leaving angry comments on Facebook. So as long as I don't have to do more than that, Joseph, I'll take your side wherever we agree. All right, that's going to wrap it up for our first actual live show of We the Individuals Live. The last two episodes were not live streamed, so I apologize for any hiccups we might have. Uh, for any of you watching, please leave us comments, let us know what you think, and give us topic ideas going forward because we will be back here next week. We will be an hour earlier then to accommodate our guest next week, Dan Sanchez. And until then, goodbye. I don't know how to cut. Spend any time as a minarchist. I did. I spent about 12 seconds as <laughs> a as a minarchist before converting to anarchy. Um, what about you guys? Jeff, we'll start with you. Sorry. Okay. Well, uh, I've been uh, <clears throat> prior to being an anarchist, I was a um, minarchist all of my life. I've never been anything else besides libertarian, and and I think it was um, probably around the time of uh, 2012 when Ron Paul got suckered out of the uh, primaries. That was um, that's right when I actually read the or heard an audio clip of uh, Rothbard's For New Liberty, where he starts talking about if the state had a monopoly on shoes for time immemorial, imagine if you're a libertarian and you came along and, and introduced the idea of privatizing shoes. And then he said this old status arguments of what about the poor people? What about the prices of shoes? What will be the last though? And he said as, as silly as these ideas are to re regarding shoes, they're almost as stupid as when you put them to any sector ran by government. So um, then I... Uh, uh, that's that's pretty much actually around that time what really made me an anarchist, and then uh, also the idea that whenever you have taxes, you're going to have a series of endless excuses to expand the state, um, even if you have minimum taxes. So I was a libertarian for years, but then um, became an anarchist in 2012. Sure. So Ron Paul opened the floodgates. I'm sure that's the answer for a lot of people, but that's a good one. I mean, that's a lot of us just had the light bulb go off through. Some simple argument like that. Blaine, I don't know you very well. This is the first we've ever met. What drove you to the, the crazy idea of anarchy? Uh, for me, it was um, a process of finding economics and uh, studying Austrian economics. And then slowly over time, I just turned. He brought me to the politics. No black guy running for president and won. And, you know, growing up, no, being, being grown up black in poor neighborhoods. And kinda, You're black? I know, right? <laughs> People rarely see that. <laughs> and being around just poverty all the time, everywhere I went, just homelessness, there's starving kids and women and men, and really it's like the, the compassion aspect is that I, I understand that government has little to no benefits for you know my community, for poverty and all that, but the idea of Ending programs like food stamps and Section 8, you know, programs that I've, that my family and families that I know have benefited from significantly. The idea of ending those and going pure anarchist versus 
being a mini artist is just still trying. A mini artist is still trying to accommodate my my views on welfare and support and compassion and all that with going full anarchy and how to uh, how how to accommodate that with that final push. And I've sure. yet to see how that's possible. Sure. Okay, I understand, and and I think that's fair. Even uh, Frederick Bastiat. Um, argued in favor of minor state-sponsored forms of welfare, as as minimalist as he was. So that's a that's a really a relatively Bastiat-esque position. So I think we can all accept that. Um, so what is the full scope, if I can ask, uh, in terms of the role of government that you believe? And when I ask this, I, I kind of also want to know, like, how how do we um, gain taxes in your minarchist ideal. What does the government do and how does it fund it? Here we go. All right. It looks like we're live for the first now live broadcast of We the Individuals Live, where we believe in the novel proposal that we each choose our own manner of being governed. For those of you that watch some of our pre-recorded shows, you already know Jeff Peterson II, the uh, founder and owner of We the Individuals. And with us again, we also have Andy Catherman. And joining us today for the first time would be Blaine Kelly, who is uh, an economics major at Bradley University. And, of course, to join us in our anarchism versus minarchism debate, which is the topic of tonight's show, we do have a real-life minarchist, which I feel are even rarer than anarchists anymore, just because you guys don't last very long before converting to anarchy, is my experience. But with us is Joseph. I didn't get your last name, and I didn't get much background information with you, so is it all right if I ask you to introduce yourself? Uh, yes, yes. Joseph Johnson is my full name. I am a student at Sacramento State University, and my major is government and soon-to-be econ. <laughs> government and soon-to-be econ. All right. So as we said, Joseph is a minarchist, and what we're doing today, it's a little bit different. Normally, I have a full list of questions, and I, I try to ask everybody um, you know, their thoughts on whatever the topic is, Bernie Sanders or left libertarianism. But since we actually have somebody that disagrees with us, I want a little bit of a back and forth. So I'm hoping, Joseph, that you can provide some questions with us about anarchy and your objections to anarchy while we provide, of course, our questions and our objections to minarchism. Um, so starting off with that, I, w I would kind of like to see from the anarchists, Jeff, Blaine, and uh, Andy, uh, what is it that drives you to anarchism? Did you turn towards uh, anarchism after reading Murray Rothbard? Uh, so I think I read For New Liberty uh, by Murray Rothbard, and uh, my hang-up, of course, was uh, those areas which the state has always uh, tended to occupy, which, of course, are police and courts um, and military defense. And so after reading those chapters uh, in Rothbard's book, that was really the starting point um, for when I became an anarchist. And then uh, from there, it's just been reading um, uh, a lot of stuff from people like Walter Block, Hans Hermann Hoppe, um, and uh, Robert Murphy. And so just over time, yeah, I, I became uh, an anarchist in the span of maybe uh, a week or two. All right. Andy, final word from you. Uh, what drove you to the, this cult? Uh, yeah, so I I probably would say I spent quite a bit, I'd say maybe like a year or two. Um, I was really kind of had my awakening. It was more economics driven, um, like uh, I think Blaine said. And uh, I was really into Austrian economics. I was really, it was such a, a good explanation. I was looking for an explanation of the after the financial crash. Um, and all of the talking heads on TV or just weren't giving me anything that I could really understand or believe. And so in, in thinking about all of the things through Austrian economics and explaining how the free market um, works and, and how it has an answer for pretty much um, every um, everything, it I, I delve mo more into like the ethics side of it. And uh, um, obviously Ron Paul was part of that, but I – as uh, Blaine said, I read uh, For New Liberty and, and uh, The Ethics of Liberty. And then I've read um, a lot from Herman Hop Hans Hermann Hoppe on like the democracy that the God, the God that failed. That was really kind of the, the nail in the coffin for me um, in the sense that uh, showing um, there's things in this world, economic goods, that, that are goods, 
and talking about government which produces bads. And that I think that was the most compelling thing that really uh, popped the light bulb for me. But um, I was pretty much bef before that I was more of a, I guess your typical Republican um, type of you know middle of the road type of, of guy. So that's so kind you of went my, full my, swing. You went re Republican all the way into anarchy. You didn't have any time spent in the whole minarchist. I think no. I think I was like for about a year. I was trying to like I read Rothbard. And I was like, well, you know, still it doesn't. Like he's got he's got me, but there's this you know the part was the defense part you know because that's the right. classic argument. That was that was the toughest argument the, for me as well. The 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 military and the courts and you know oh you're an anarchist so you don't believe in law like oh you're you're just for chaos and I think those straw man kind of um, were in the back of my head but uh, yeah I, I did I'd say for about a, a year I was like grasping at straws to kind of justify my minarchism. So I probably have quite a bit of co in common with uh, uh, with Joseph, um, at least well, where, I'm sure where we he's all at right now. There's not a very wide chasm between minarchy and anarchy. So yeah. Joseph, um, obviously we came to you last because you're the only person that is not an anarchist. So what is, what's the holdup, man? The holdup is that I, I, was, I was Democrat, you know, Obama was my big political socialization event.